with lovely colors straight from heaven they are a joy to see pink or kelani rose from maui yellow gilin mal from oahu soft purple orchids from kauai red red hua from hawaii snow white ginger but it's over pit. <laughs> so be careful. They're a little bit tall. But we need it up on the top. So what? Pick enough um, pala'a step here for your coupés. And don't pull out the roots. Can you reach that one? Okay, without breaking the branch. Just a tip. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Oh. Then the rest to go. This part is with what is called the liko or the bud of the oh, this is an ohialehua tree. And the ohialehua tree was um, is a symbol of the goddess Laka. And the flowers and the ferns that are associated with the mountain are dedicated to the goddess Laka who is the goddess of the hula. And all of these things are placed on the altar or ukuahu as it is called in the process of studying the hula, the dance of the Hawaiian people. There's a legend that talks about two lovers and uh, Pele, got, Pele, the goddess of the volcano, got angry because she was in love with the male and he loved this beautiful young woman and so she turned them into the tree and the lehua is the symbol of the woman and the ohia is the symbol of the man. And every time you pick a lehua, it's supposed to pour. <laughs> so I've already picked the lehua. We should expect some rain shortly. Our musical origins go back to our primal past. 
probably back to Indonesia and Southeast Asia and beyond from whence our kupuna arrived thousands of years ago. In the pre-Cook period, our music was essentially that heard from the pahu or the drum, from the uli uli uh, or the uh, bamboo rattle, uh, from, in short, our percussion instruments. Uh, obviously, we did not have uh, Western tonal systems or harmonics or things like that. Uh, so out of that primal musical heritage came the mele and the oli, that is the chants for which Hawaiians have been famous for. The idea of chant was to make the word sounded or make the word as a living communication so that the word was extremely important and many times the actual poetry was thought to have mana or some kind of cosmological power that was an important part of the communication. It was for that reason, probably, that the first kinds of Hawaiian music were single line chants, that is just melody, no harmony, so that you could hear the word very clearly. Even the hula, the dance, which we think is so very important today, in the past, was only supposed to be a way to further illustrate or enhance the idea of the word. Those chants tell about the most important myths and legends of our past. And those legends or myths in turn tell about our view of the world and our feelings towards the cosmos, towards our purpose, on earth and in the universe. So it was through the mele and the oli that uh, our forefathers were able not only to explain but also to retain their knowledge and understanding of life on this planet. <laughs> Velitia hio tavihini maitalua e hie No ta lua pa ia makania ta put lena Ke hali hali tia la lao When you wait a tie o haena Hayena aloha e anoa te aloha Ako ola wa wi te ita ua e kokolo a le po mai ana e te u Ako ola Ako ola wa wi te ita ua e kokolo a le po mai ana e te u And then came Captain Cook. And uh, with Captain Cook uh, came enormous change, not only in our social and political and economic life, uh, but also in our philosophical or musical life uh, as well. The principal difference, I guess, was that the missionaries introduced harmony, that is singing in parts with chords, which the Hawaiians called himeni, which uh, comes from the English word hymn. Uh, besides the influence of the missionaries, however, there were also the influences coming from the whalers, who also used harmony and instruments like guitar and even accordion to accompany themselves. 
so that, as some people have said, the Hawaiians got from Western music the best and the worst in terms of the kinds of music that they were going to have. The chant that we did earlier was written for King Kamehameha I, and it reflects a blending of the society. You find that there's harmony in it, and there's a call and response type of, um, of chanting that was part of the influence of the foreigners and the missionaries. The text itself is very, very old. It comes from the time of Kamehameha, but the, it had been put to music and it's been adapted to Western style song. And so it's a blend of the two cultures, a blend of the old Hawaiian and, and, and the introduction of, of the missionary hymnal type three-part harmony. The idea of himeni soon became applied not just to church hymns, but to general part singing, so that you could have secular songs about things like a beautiful waterfall or a home, a particular home, that uh, was also known as a himeni. This kind of music was usually accompanied by guitar and ukulele, so that you had both a harmonic accompaniment and also a rhythmic accompaniment coming from the same instrument. We have thought of the ukulele as a Hawaiian instrument, uh, but the fact of the matter is that it was imported by the first Portuguese immigrants to Hawaii who landed here in the 1870s. And um, the ukulele uh, became popular because it was a small, convenient instrument that was easy to learn, and the Portuguese were uh, pretty good at it and uh, they were also good musicians. One of the Hawaiians who uh, took a real liking to the ukulele happened to be uh, the king, uh, King Kalakaua, who uh, liked it so much that he hired uh, Portuguese ukulele makers uh, to make uh, these ukuleles and also allowed them to use his royal insignia as a trademark for the first ukuleles that were manufactured. Um, Hawaiians uh, became so adept at uh, playing it uh, that I think they soon uh, acquired the ukulele and made it part of the Hawaiian musical heritage. 
Now here's a song, that a Hawaiian song, that it was the first Hawaiian song that made a national hit in the USA, written by William Kaili Ma'i, who played at the San Francisco World's Fair, played it in the mainland for the first time in 1916. Some of you may remember your grandparents singing this. Honey kau a wiki wiki, sweet brown maiden said to me, as she gave me language lessons on the beach at Waikiki. Honey kau a wiki wiki, she repeated playfully. Oh, those lips were so. The term ukulele has a rather picturesque origin. They said that it was called ukulele because it reminded them of the uku, that is a flea, because the way in which the performer uh, used his fingers was looking like a flea jumping around on the instrument. And here's another song that was written way back in 1875, but is, but is very much appreciated appreciated by the musicians who, who play music in Hawaii today. It's called Ualana Kila o Kawaiho by Mekia Ke Alakai, written in 1875. <laughs> Hawaiians have also contributed a style of guitar playing called uh, slack key or kiho alu. Slack key is a style of uh, playing the guitar which uh, uh, uses various kinds of keys. Uh, the keys are slack uh, and uh, the resulting style uh, with the type of rhythm and with the type of songs that are played uh, is now known as uh, slack key. But how that came about is not very clear, but it most likely developed uh, when the vaqueros, or the Spanish cowboys, uh, came to Hawaii uh, and brought with them their guitars. And um, in time, the vaqueros who not only taught their Hawaiian counterparts how to ride and lasso cattle, but also how to play the guitar, uh, must have taught them uh, that, and from there, Hawaiians adapted uh, the steel guitar, that is, the slack key guitar method. Raymond Connie is the recipient of the National Folk Heritage Award. We're awfully proud of that fact because only 11 people in the United States win this award. It's comparable to that of the Congressional Medal of Honor. So without further ado, one of our own sons of Hawaii, Master of the Kihoalu, ladies and gentlemen, Raymond Kane. Mahalo, Lord. I go to Washington to represent each and every one of you, not only for myself, but for Hawaii, the state of Hawaii, for each and every individual here. 
Remember, I go and represent you all. Hello. And now at this time, we got these hula girls coming up here. And I'm going to sing a song in Slack Key. And the song is Pull Mickey Out. Every time I hear this song, it reminds me of Gary Pahanui, who was one of the greatest Slack Key players. And believe me, when I, hear, when I sing this song, it reminds me of Gabby Pahanui. And well, he was my, he was my good friend. What, what can I say? History speaks for itself. And I go to Washington thinking of him too as well. He was the greatest of them all. Gabby Pahanui. <laughs> Uh, well, Slacky started about 150 years ago. And uh, Vancouver came from England. He brought some cattle over here. And he gave it to King Kamehameha the first. So Kamehameha, so uh, he told Kim King Kamehameha to put a taboo on the cattle, let it grow, you see, so there'll be, be more cattle in the future. So when he died, the, the taboo wasn't, wasn't, wasn't left. So until, uh, until King Kamehameha III that took over, then the people started, the, the, then the cattle be, be, uh, beginning to uh, ruin the crops and the land and the, going into the tire patches. So the people started to, to sort of grumble, you know, and uh, making a big fuss about these cattle, and it was getting dangerous. See, and the children uh, were, were, they were, you know, invading in, uh, in, in, their, in their land and in their yards where the children played. So it would be pretty dangerous, you know, for the cattle to be there. So King Kamehameha III, he went to the mainland. So maybe he can find something, you know, try to see if there's any, anybody that can, that can handle the cattle. So he went up there and he went to a rodeo show. And uh, during that time, uh, there was a lot of Mexican boys and uh, Vascaros and uh, Spanish uh, cowboys mixed with Spanish. So he was very impressed with the, uh, how they had, were handling the, the, the cattle, you know, and roping the cattle and stuff like that, you know, and, and whatever. So he hired all those people, you know, asked them to sign a contract to come over here and see if they can round out the, uh, the cattle over here. So they all came over here and they all round up the cattle and everything. During that time, they brought their guitars over. And after their work, you know, they sit down by a campfire and they start playing some music, you know, and, uh, and they, they were teaching the Hawaiian uh, how, to, how to do cowboy work. So they were, doing, they were doing fine. So all of a sudden, the Hawaiians were very impressed with that, with that guitar. It was the first time they seen it. So uh, they had usually they had two guitars, you know, one play and the other one to come together, see, helping the, the melody while the one is picking on, on, on one guitar and the other, is, the, other, the other guitar is strumming along with the melody. So um, 
and the Hawaiians were they they really enjoyed their, their, their type of songs and music. You know, it was was very uh, it was pretty and so uh, then the time came when they had to go back to uh, back to the mainland. So some some stayed and some left. Some they met some good Hawaiian fellows who were good people. So they gave the guitar to the Hawaiians. So all they had was just um, one, one or two guitars. But you see, they were on different islands when they, they received these guitars. And uh, like I say, the cattle were running wild on every island almost. So, um, so this Hawaiian guy, he, he started playing this this this, this uh, slacky guitar. And that's when the slacky guitar started to be uh, be popular. You know, it started to be created into. Uh, uh, the guitar, so they they had they had their songs, so they they, they started like this. They tune it down from the standard tuning. Now this is the standard tuning. That's what the Spanish use this tuning. Okay, now. The Hawaiians, they, they really enjoyed that. They liked that, the sound, it was beautiful. So he couldn't do that, so he tuned his guitar down the way he thinks it suit for himself. The Hawaiian songs were a little different. So, the, so they started off like this, with the melody only. My ku, my ku aloha. But you see that there was nothing there. So one day, this guy started messing around with the bass. Hey, then he started going all the way down to the last string. Hey, they got something here. So they put it together, see? My See, the bass added to the melody makes it makes it complete and with the voice go along with it it's just it it, 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 it that's what slack key is all about by having uh, a bass and the melody together in one instead of separate that's what makes slack key guitar this is how tutu used to play tutu is my grandfather old you know but he remember his old friend he used to play this song way back when he was a cowboy
Is that one of them? There's two strings, up and down. The idea of slack key is to get a very melodious sound and a rather intimate sound. So that slack key is not as good a music for large outdoor concerts. It's much more what we call back porch music, sitting around with a primo, that is a, a kind of a local Hawaiian beer in your hand, listening to this music and sort of just relaxing. Part singing in Hawaii, that is this himeni style, uh, it became customary for the groups to be all male or all female. We're not sure whether this was the influence of the missionaries or just the way Hawaiians like to do things, but it resulted in a unique singing style being developed. That is, in order for, uh, for example, an all male group to sing the soprano and alto parts, they had to sing very high in falsetto which became known in Hawaiian as leo ki'e ki'e. This style of male falsetto singing 
used a lot of breaks or sort of cracks in the voice because a lot of times men can't hold that falsetto that long. There is a kind of a natural break in the voice. But this was then incorporated as part of the style. Well, the women also got interested in singing in this rather unique fashion so that now we have female singers also singing falsetto style. And uh, it's a rather curious uh, situation where you have women copying men singing like women. Uh, another peculiar feature of Hawaiian vocal styles is uh, yodeling, which was probably introduced uh, into the islands in the 1890s by a music teacher who taught at the Kamehameha schools named Theodore Richards. Uh, who learned it uh, as a member of his uh, college chorus. But yodeling took in Hawaii because uh, of the popularity of uh, paniolo songs, that is, cowboy songs. And um, yodeling uh, may have also uh, been uh, close to the kinds of uh, music or songs that the vaqueros, the Spanish cowboys, uh, may have sung on the Big Island uh, in Waimea or the Parker Ranch uh, when they first came in the 1830s. <laughs> Pan Alley was a great period in the development of Hawaiian music because through Tin Pan Alley, Hawaiian music exerted a uh, profound influence on at least American perception of, Amer uh, of Hawaiian music. Uh, Tin Pan Alley music was what American composers thought Hawaiian music was all about. And Wiki Wacky Woo, for example, was, uh, was just the way they thought uh, Hawaiians did it. And, uh, Hawaiian music was uh, popularized as a result so that uh, by 1920, 1925, Hawaiian music records sold more than any other kind of record in the United States uh, record market, believe it or not. Even later, when the cruise ships brought large numbers of tourists by ship, the old Lurleen cruise ships, to Hawaii, there also developed a tradition of singing that used a combination of English and Hawaiian texts, referred to now as hapahali, which means half white or half foreign singing. Now these kinds of songs were very accessible to tourists who didn't really understand Hawaiian language. So even though the language had changed to at least half English, it was still accomplishing the same important idea of communication. This lady, a very dynamic personality in her own right, is a top musician, singer, entertainer, would you put your hands together and welcome Auntie Violet Pahu. Oh, here, oh, way. Can you play money? Can you play money? Can you play money? Feel for the kahua. Who can be the kahua? Huli my oe. Huli my oe. Mamu upono. Mamu upono. Mamu upono. Oh, 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 o
An in interesting juncture at this point is the invention of the steel, steel guitar, or the acoustic guitar, which uh, happened in about the 1880s uh, when a young lad from a town called Laie, uh, attending the Kamehameha schools, the school set aside by Princess Bernice Bawai for the education of Hawaiian children, uh, accidentally um, hit upon the idea of using a bar and running it over a gu a guitar strings. Uh, and out of that uh, eventually evolved the steel guitar as we know it. This vocal-like sound of sliding, which was developed here in Hawaii, was, quote, exported, unquote, to the mainland and uh, was very popular, became very popular with country western groups. Of course, it underwent its own development among uh, country western musicians because we don't really have the pedal steel here that was developed on the mainland and then re-imported back to Hawaii. So that you have a lot of common links now between country western steel playing and Hawaiian steel playing and many of the performers like Billy Hugh Len for example can go back and forth, can play Hawaiian steel, Hawaiian style and Hawaiian steel country western style, whatever the market desires. On the steel guitar, undoubtedly the best that Hawaii has right now, Billy Hewlin.
That's Billy Hulan. Thank you so much, Billy. By the 1940s, Hawaiian music uh, was well established in the United States. Indeed, it was well established around the world because internationally, Hawaiian music was probably one of the most important ethnic musics uh, around the world. Uh, indeed, there were Japanese, German, Dutch, English, French, uh, and Indonesian Hawaiian music bands uh, who not only performed in their national circuits, nightclub circuits, but who also uh, produced and sold Hawaiian music records. Hawaiian music um, took a decline after the Second World War and um, has uh, not been able to recover its status uh, ever since. Aloha now to Auntie Genoa Kiave. Aloha. Aloha. Boy, it's nice to have you here to talk to us about a subject that uh, is not easy to define, but uh, what, in your impression, is Hawaiian music? Let's start with that very general statement. Well, first of all, Hawaiian music is beautiful sounds. Mm -hmm. And if you understand the words of a song that people have sung for many years. You understand the meaning of the words. You can sing it with that inner feeling and it just comes out, just flows out so beautiful. Mm -hmm. You say that the beautiful sounds of Hawaii uh, stem from this art form that you call Hawaiian music. Now, right. a lot of people have said that this particular art form is, is going out the window. It's kind of like going the, the, the way of the dinosaur becoming extinct. What do you think about that when people say that? Well, when they say that, all I can say to them is that as long as I'm alive, Hawaiian music will still be alive. That's wonderful. Just for you.
the good Lord take good care of all of you and keep you safe. Did you know I kill me? Hawaiian music came precariously close to dying out, or so we thought, in the early 1970s, when we could count on our fingers the number of uh, steel guitar players, uh, when we could uh, listen to only one radio station that played Hawaiian music of any kind, uh, when it was very difficult to find Hawaiian music being played in Waikiki and other places. So a few of us organized the Hawaiian Music Foundation in a deliberate attempt to revive the music. And uh, this was, I think, a uh, fascinating experiment in deliberately uh, reviving a culture because out of our efforts uh, came the Hawaiian Renaissance in large part. Young Hawaiians were becoming more aware of their heritage, trying to go back to discover their language and their customs, and also became quite activist in trying to regain their Hawaiian lands, so that it was not just an artistic movement, but it was also a very important social and political movement as well. In the late 60s and early 70s, when I graduated from high school and started playing music, I was looking for things to play music that interested me. And those things took me away from the islands and traveled. And it was upon returning back home in early 1971 that I touched upon what for me was a very good realization. And that was I could sing music, but in order to sing music from the heart, it had to deal with the environment that I was living in. Hawaiian music has always been a part of my life, growing up here in Hawaii and actually attending school and really never living away from Hawaii. Uh, the family started the Hawaiian music appreciation and it continues through my life today. And I think I'm part of a generation, a fortunate generation, that has had the opportunity to learn the music, enjoy the music of those that have gone before us, our kupuna, and perpetuate what they have started. The music for us, our group, Olomana and myself, has given us an opportunity to meet and delve back into those things which are Hawaiian, which those things that are fundamental to life in Hawaii, and that is the protection of the land and the natural things that are so much a part of Hawaiian culture. For us, that is trying to keep it alive by bringing thoughts of it into the music. And I think whatever we can do as musicians and performers and composers to bring to those that are not living in Hawaii, the spirit and aloha of Hawaii, then that is our mission, and that's what we enjoy doing, and aloha mai. It's there in the air, can you feel it? Hawaii is calling. Hawaii is called 
one of the earliest chants uh, tells about the Polynesian migration over to the Hawaiian Islands. It's called Eia Hawaii, and it tells of the Hawaiians as they first sighted the islands of Hawaii, and it says, here is Hawaii, the island. Eia Hawaii he motu. I am a man, I am the person that I have come to settle on these islands. Eia Hawaii he motu. Ahe kanaka iya hae, ahe kamana tahiti, laua o kapulana ke hau, iya no hawaii iya hae motu, ahe kanaka iya hae. I am a child of Kopulehua, I am a child of my far off ancestors, and I have come to settle these lands. called Ka'ala. In Hawaiian it means the way, the path. And for many Hawaiians it represents so much about our past but it also connects us to our future. Here we grow taro which is the ancient and sacred plant. Here we grow tea leaf which is a medicinal plant. This place was the place of the first music, of the water feeding the lo'i, of the birds, of the people working. This whole place, the land, the Aina. Aina means that which feeds, that which nourishes, but much more than just in a physical sense. It's a place that feeds your soul. It's the thing that keeps us living. It's the thing that is celebrated in music. I have a poem that I'd like to share. It's called Choosing My Name. When I was born, my mother gave me three names. Christabel, Yoshie, and Puanani. Christabel was my English name, my social security card name, my school name, the name I gave when teachers asked me for my real name. It was a safe name. Yoshie was my home name, my everyday name, the name that reminded my father's family that I was Japanese, even though my nose, hips, and feet were wide. The name that made me acceptable to them who called my Hawaiian mother Kuroi, black. It was a saving name. Kuanani is my chosen name. It's my Pico name connecting me to the Aina and the Kai and the Poekahiko. It's my blessing, my burden, my amulet, my spear. Who came first to Hawaii? Of the Kanaka. Now who came first to Hawaii? All of us Kanakas. Then how come us Kanakas? We know own the Aina. And how come us Kanakas? We only like fight one another. We only want to pretend and be like the greedy man. Don't want to give back, don't want to 
share Don't even want to try to work the land I said, now how can you sit back While they're desecrating the land And how can you sit back While they're desecrating the ocean And how can we fight back We got to read, research, vote, and understand And how can they are desecrated and tell us that they still love this land. Oh, wait, oh, wait. At present, the Hawaiian music scene is really quite complex because of the younger generation's interest in the past, you have the preservation of older styles and older repertoire as one aspect of that rebirth or reinterest. You also have new pieces being composed in the old style. And on top of that, you have pieces which are being composed and performed that partake of rock and jazz and even country western that are really part of the mainstream idea of Hawaiian and American mainland music together. This land of aloha. Our amazing feat, 21 years of Hawaiian music. We are KCCN Honolulu. Hawaiian Radio. It's about 12 minutes now to 3 o'clock, KCCN's Afternoon Club. I'm Brickwood, and it's Hawaiian radio at its finest. Special guest here today, a good buddy of mine, a fellow colleague, Hawaiian style, Israel Kamaka Viva Ole. Aloha, brother. Ho! Ho! How's it, brother? Well, you know what we want to talk about? Let's talk about the beautiful, angelic voices of the Makaha Sons of Niha. You guys got a style that uh, is hard to duplicate, but here and again, I hear that style in church choirs a lot through the years we've grown musically um, we've we've explored the outer boundaries of Hawaiian music meaning not only Hawaiian music but uh, we we'll say what contemporary country uh, rock reggae calypso Cajun you know you, you name it mm -hmm. and we utilize all of these into one certain you know structure like like you say church choral yeah. From the hot. From the hot. This next song I'd like to do, ladies and gentlemen, is written by a very close brother of ours. Comes from the big island of Hawaii. For those of you that don't know where that, uh, that's over there. That way. Song written by brother uh, Mickey Iwani. Song he wrote um, during the time of the movement. <laughs> Song's called Hawaii 78 and it goes like this. Here we go. Oh, there's 
smiles be content that and by Cry for the gods, cry for the people, cry for the land that was taken away, and then yet you'll find of a Saw traffic lights and railroad tracks. How would they feel about this modern city life? Tears would come from each other's eyes as they would start to realize that our land is in great, great danger now. All that the king has done he conquered all these islands now there's his condominium how would he feel if he saw a lady One of the questions for young Hawaiian musicians is, can you make a living doing this? And the question is a rather qualified yes, because financially, for example, the recording market in Hawaii is rather small, that the local recording industry is distributed only here in Hawaii. So many of these artists don't have any kind of mainland exposure at all, or the opportunity to sell uh, lots and lots of records. The same thing happens with um, uh, singers uh, who are going to tour. They tour mostly around here in the state and often maybe to California or to Washington where there are large Hawaiian populations, but not much more than that. Uh, the idea of publishing music in Hawaii uh, has not been a big industry here. So that, yes, you can make it financially, but most of the very fine Hawaiian musicians all hold day jobs somewhere else. Another aspect of this is that often the Hawaiian musician is expected to share his music for free. And it is a little bit hard to tell your auntie, no, I don't want to play for your baby luau unless you pay me. That's not very Hawaiian. So a lot of the music is given away for free. And all those free uh, sharings of music also mean that the Hawaiian musician doesn't get paid for his job. So that's one of the dilemmas for Hawaiian musicians. To be Hawaiian means to share. But be, to be a musician means you also have to make a living at it. So there, there are, how do you do this? One of the ways is to go work for another job and then come back and play Hawaiian music at night. Please help me. Please help me welcome to who is the Sam Bernard Trio with Kalana Kasparovic on bass, Sam Bernard on the ukulele, and Clyde Lono on the guitar. Aloha no, everybody, and um, we're going to feature our cousin Sam Bernard at this time, a song from his album uh, entitled Kuhio Beach. It's a beautiful song that reminisced long, long ago, back in the days of the 30s and 40s. Picture yourself when there were no high-rises in Waikiki and seeing the beautiful torches as they're lit one by one in the evening for the beautiful luau's that happen as they reflect on the ocean. Our cousin at this time at Kuhio Beach.
You'll hear music of old days And the Beach Boys are now playing and singing of their Lily Singing in the moonlight under the palm trees Down on the sun And the beach boys under the palm trees where music lingers on. Singing in the moonlight under the palm trees down on the sand tonight. And the beach boys under the palm trees where music lingers on. Under the palm trees where music lingers on. Mr. Samuel, I'm a hug. Beautiful song for you, Beach. Mahalo, thank you. Not enough people can hear the type of music that you saw today. It's a very special type of Hawaiian music that the tourist doesn't get to see when they come to Hawaii unless they come to Hula's, because frankly, there's no place else to see this type or style of presentation any place else in Waikiki. There used to be a couple of places on the beach, but they're no longer there. Uh, without this big, magnificent banyan tree that we have here, uh, we probably wouldn't be doing it either. So we always say mahalo to the banyan tree, too. Aloha, yeah, and here we got our lovely young ladies, the lovely young classes known as the Nico class from Lehua Dance Whatcha? Company. And they share with you a song entitled Pua Mamane. Thank you, ladies. Mahalo. To try to define Hawaiian music is very difficult because there are as many definitions, I suppose, as there are people. My own concept of what is Hawaiian music revolves, again, around the language. It should be in Hawaiian language, or mostly in Hawaiian language. And if it's going to be of the 
so-called Himene type of music, it has to have, from my point of view, the, the feeling of Hawaii, which means love of the land, celebration of people. The text has to have some kind of an honoring quality about it. And the music, the sound of the music itself, usually means a fairly rhythmical kind of music that, if not danced to, at least you can gesture to or nod your head to or maybe even tap on your beer bottle if that's what you're up to. Aloha Kauai, a song written by Auntie Mikey Ayule. And we feature the beautiful voice of Mr. Sam Bernard, Mr. Clyde Lono, and myself as we share this special song with you. with a special song from the island of Maui featuring Cousin Sam again. Once again, on behalf of Hula's Bar and Lay Stand and our Backyard Bash, to all of you, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Mahalo. Mr. Clyde Lono on guitar. Lono. Mr. Sam Bernard on ukulele. I'm Colonel Kasparovich, your host of Basement. The song is out of Yalo Kalon.
everybody, Marlo. Thank Hello. you. Hello.